Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance. So that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee be happy in it through Christ our Lord, amen. Mary, seat of wisdom, amen. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So, we want to talk about in this conference the Blessed Sacrament, but also Mass, how to prepare for Mass, how to prepare for communion. Uh, and then all, both the lead up and then also the um, uh, Thanksgiving afterwards. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about, because uh, all the preparation and everything about it ultimately has to do with what the nature of this thing actually is. So when we say uh, that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, we're actually uh, referring to a few things. One is, um, there, or there's a few aspects to that, I should say. The first is, of course, it's the divinity. So in the Eucharist, as when the priest says the words of consecration, once the consecration actually occurs, of course, the church uses the word transubstantiation. There's actually a change of substance. And the substance is what the thing actually is. So there's actually, it changes from the bread, the substance of bread or the substance of wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so this means that uh, even though it has the appearance of bread and wine, that is, it means the accidental qualities, such as the color, uh, the taste, um, etc. those things are still pertained to the bread, but that the, uh, but that the, substance has actually changed what the thing actually is has changed now this is something which is consistent obviously from the very beginning um from in christ talks about it in john 6 but it's also even in the early church fathers they talk about this in the same way in fact you get to the about the end of the seventh century and there's already greek terms that make um uh, reference to the change, they're trying to grapple for specific words. It's not until the term transubstantiation is coined in the in the, uh, about, I think it's like 1032 or something like that, 1048, somewhere around in there, that term is coined. And then the, the I think it's uh, Innocent the second or third, one of those two guys, picks up the term and actually uses it officially. And so from that point on, the term transubstantiation is actually used, but it basically just means what the thing is actually changes. But the fact, despite the fact that the terminological changes became more precise, meant that the church herself had seen this from the very beginning. And so the essential teaching and doctrine of the church has not changed, obviously. It's just the, uh, the terminological precision was improved over the course of centuries until you get to transubstantiation. And then from that point on, it always remains the same. After that, there's just a few discussions about you know, how do the accents of the bread remain and how do they, uh, you know, are they miraculously sustained? And the answer is actually yes. Um, and so, uh, But there's a, there's a variety of different things, just bits and facets of it. But after that, there's not that much theological development in relationship to it until heresy starts setting in with the modernists and then they start grappling, grappling with certain other words, which of course falsify the actual church teaching. But that, that all being said, so... If it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, we have to stop and take consider this because this is actually, when we go to Mass, we're going to uh, to the place, uh, and technically speaking, they used to say that once the Blessed Sacrament, once the consecration has occurred and the Blessed Sacrament is present, then because God is substantially present, all of those in heaven who are present to God's substance are also 
present because of the fact that now the substance of God is actually here. It's the whole of the divinity, too, is in the host, right? It's contained in the host. Now, historically, they used to say that, and St. Thomas says that, in the host, the actual presence of God is coterminous with the limits of the actual host. So outside of it, he's not present. But in here, he is. So in each of the each of it, or in each aspect of it, the whole, the totality of God is, pre is present. This is why you can, and because it's the substance and it's not connected to the accidents, you can cr break the bread in half, there are the accidents of the bread in half, technically, and God is fully in both at that point. Okay, so the point being in all this is that it's fully the divinity. Now, if you think about what that means, it means that all of the saints and all the angels in heaven and all the people that are in heaven, as soon as the host is present, are present in a certain sense in the church, in the place in which the host is actually contained. Uh, it also means in, the, in relationship to the divinity, um, and they're also present by virtue of the fact of the beatific vision, that God's substance is pressed to all their intellects, and so there's always a presence of God uh, or the presence of the of the communion of saints and angels any time God's presence because they're joined to him in a certain sense okay but it also means that, the, that if his if his divinity is present it means that what's sitting on the on the altar is omniscient omnipotent it's the thing that's sustaining the totality of the universe in existence and so when the priest holds it he's actually holding the creator and the one who sustains the totality of the universe in existence in his hands. Now, why am I going into all this? Well, first, it basically boils down to this. How we approach this thing and how we handle it is directly proportionate to the nature of a thing. So, let's go back to my example of nitroglycerin. If you're handling nitroglycerin, you're gonna handle it in a very specific way because if you drop it or if it gets too violently moved or what have you, it can explode. And so you have to handle it with kit gloves. You have to handle it in a very specific way uh, in order so that you don't end up dead, right? Now, some people say, oh, well, God isn't that way. He isn't really. If you look in the Old Testament, the guy that just, when the Ark of the Covenant, and we're not even talking about God, we're just talking about the Ark of the Covenant. When the Ark of the Covenant was starting to tip over, he put his hand up to steady the Ark of the Covenant, and God smited him and killed him for touching the Ark of the Covenant. That's how serious when it comes to holy things that our approach has to be to these things. And here, uh, we're not talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're actually talking about the covenant itself because Christ, the Blessed Sacrament, is the law in a certain sense. He's the one who the promulgator of the law, he begets the law, and he is the New Testament, etc. Okay, so, and he is, the new, he is that with whom we have the new covenant with. Okay, so the totality of God is present in this. So when you're thinking about mass, so mass is the atemporal participation in the Calvary sacrifice, and we want to unpack that a little bit. Atemporal means that what we are doing, so if you look at the history of time, that when Christ hung upon the cross, if we're saying Mass, he, at this point, once the Eucharist becomes present, or the, I should say the Blessed Sacrament uh, and the host is changed into the body, blood, and soul, and the of Christ, there is an atemporal participation. What does that mean? It actually means that the same God that's present here and dying upon the cross is the same one that's contained in the Eucharist. And so there's this atemporal participation. It's literally like being at Calvary at that point. Okay. And so the divinity of, uh, uh, part of it has to do with the divinity, but the body, blood, soul, and uh, soul and divinity of Christ. So we receive his, even when we receive the communion, we're receiving not just his divinity, we're receiving the soul of Christ, we're receiving the body of Christ, and that's the whole of his body, entire, and his blood, all in the same thing that's contained. Okay, so this, remember what Christ said to the apostles 
He said, all power on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and baptize, okay? So this thing, that once it's consecrated and it's sitting on the altar, is that which contains the totality of all of the power to be exercised and will ever be exercised in the universe from the time of Christ when he ascended on. So this basically means that this thing that's sitting there, as I mentioned, it's all powerful, but it also, it's the one who gets to apply the power. So you're dealing, you know, it would be analogous to, uh, you know, people when they go to see the, the Pope um, or when they go see, you know, uh, an important, uh, like the president or things like that, how they behave in the presence, normally speaking, when they're normal virtuous people, is they're very careful about how they actually do that. So in the mass, as we as we're as the mass is being offered, of course, it is the representation of the Calvary sacrifice, uh, a temporally, of course, but it's it's kind of the the bringing of God present to us. So as soon as the consecration occurs, God is actually present. All right. Now, this is important because it basically means, as I go back to my nitroglycerin example, it means with how we approach the mass, which is that the ritual through which God's presence is made presence is made substantially. That ritual has to be treated a certain way, and we have to prepare for it a certain way, because we're talking about the greatest act or the most sublime thing that it has ever occurred in human history. And so, when we go to this, it's greater than any wedding we might go to. It's greater than any kind of reception or meeting or anything. It's the greatest thing that's ever occurred. And so how we approach it has to be one which involves uh, that we give it due honor. That is, we recognize its excellence. We don't go in flip-flops. We don't go like we're going to the beach. We don't go like we're going to, uh, you know, so I got to go to mass now. And so you just, you know, you go in jeans and all that type of stuff. I mean, if you can't change because of the circumstances, etc. Well, that's one thing. But if you have the opportunity, you should be dressing in a way that's proportionate to this thing in some manner without being too showy or too flashy, without causing admiratio. But the point being is in all of this is that it ultimately should be giving us fear of the Lord. Now, fear of the Lord is uh, it's a reverential fear or recognition that we are capable or easily uh, capable of offending God by what we do. And as a result of that, because this, uh, the Blessed Sacrament is, uh, you know, if we use again the analogy of nitroglycerin, it's something that has to be handled extraordinarily careful because if this thing which we are, which we are handling has the power to literally wipe out the entire universe or simply to take our lives, literally, as we saw in um, the case of the Ark of the Covenant, then it has to be handled and approached in a very significant way, in a very careful way. And so due solicitude has to be actually given. If we start getting sloppy or careless, then what's gonna happen is God's gonna retract his grace and we're gonna start to see a decline in our spiritual lives or even you know even more severe things that can actually happen so the ritual of the mass when we prepare for it it means we should have uh, proper modesty we should be dressed in a proper fashion when we go to it our demeanor while we are there in the preparation there should be no talking in the church uh, in one parish that I was actually in um, right before I got there the prior pastor would tell people, oh, if you want to come talk to me in the chat, uh, sacristy, just come talk to me. And then he would come out of the sacristy just talking to everybody. And so that when I showed up, everyone's just yakking in the church, right, before mass and after mass, which obviously is an indicator that they're, they're not even reflecting on what they're doing. If you're going to be present to the most solemn event in all of history, you wouldn't be yakking it up like you are in an auditorium. You'd be quiet. You'd be uh, reflective, pensive about what's just about to happen, etc. So there should be, before you actually go, you should try and get there sufficiently soon enough, properly dressed, having a proper demeanor, get into the pew, of course, and then there should be a proper um, uh, spiritual preparation for this. Uh, 
which is twofold. One is you got to bury the hatchet with all the other people before you show up, as we say. You know, it says if you find your at the altar and there's so, your brother has something against you, we'll go talk to him and get that worked out first, right? So there has to be forgiveness. There has to be all those things that have to, have to occur before we even show up to this thing. So that when we go, there's nothing that's between us and God. And the second point thing is, is we have to prepare ourselves internally by disposition, both emotionally, and that's going to become through our reflection so that our emotions are subdued and sub, subordinated to reason but also that our, um, our intellect is properly focused, we're not distracted, etc. So there should be a proper preparation, either by a set of prayers, asking God to help you not be distracted. So there should be a proper preparation before you get there, not just rush in and then get to Mass and then rush out. There should be a proper preparation so that you can actually enter into the mysteries with greater focus. And that's in relationship to the Mass. Obviously, when it comes to the um, Blessed Sacrament, um, and so back up, if we're distracted, if we just run in and, and we're distracted this whole thing, basically what a distraction is, if you actually look at a distraction, um, the structure of a distraction, it is basically um, the pursuit of a lesser good over a greater good. You're actually pursuing something in your mind, you're thinking about something in your mind, that is a more lowly basis than the actual thing that you should be preparing for in mass, that is God, right? And so, and it's analogous to, if you had a very close relationship, like with your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or someone else, and you're in the presence of each other, you make the arrangements to actually be in the presence of each other, and then as soon as the person started talking, you started looking all over the place, the person would realize you're not even paying attention. You're not present to me, right? And so this is, uh, uh, and, this, and Christ himself said it, you know, that they, their, leaps, their lips praise me, but their heart is far from me, right? So they're already somewhere else. But the distractions, this is why we have to work on the distractions and realize that God is actually slighted by our distractions because we're allowing, if that is if we give in to them voluntarily, that is because we're basically showing to him that these other things that we want are actually more important to us than he is, right? So there's already kind of a sliding. There has to be a proper and decorum in our behavior when we're sitting in the church. We shouldn't be rubbernecking and looking all over the place and everything like that because that is also, uh, you know, going to be offensive to God. There should be a, a real seriousness and there shouldn't be a laziness. There should be proper time. We have to get there in, in time enough to be properly prepared and not just cut it right down to the last minute to get there in time so that when the priest walks out, we're there. There should, again, be some proper preparation so that when we actually, uh, when Mass actually starts, we can remain focused on God in peace without distraction. In the pews, of course, um, one of the things we should be doing is turning off cell phones, doing anything, get rid of every kind of thing that's going to be distracting during that particular, uh, that during the Mass. Um, we should also arrange ourselves in the pews so that we're not, you know, being too comfortable or not comfortable enough and all that. All those things that are necessary in relationship to um, proper external disposition. And then the interior disposition is there should be some types of acts of devotion or prayers that are not just to help us to get focused, but actually dispose us towards a loving participation in the actual Calvary sacrifice so that when our Lord becomes present, our love and affections of anything else can be put aside and they can rest solely in Him. Okay. As far as the Blessed Sacrament goes, of course, this is another thing that has to be handled. So you're talking about something which is all-powerful that you're handling, right? It's, 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 it's more, you have to be more delicate and more concerned about the manner in which that's handled than it is in relationship to the nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is just going to kill you, but this thing has the ability to damn you. So you have to be very, you have to be very careful with how you have it. Again, the fact that people have a laissez-faire attitude, I think, is based on one particular problem. We're back to the whole problem of the principle of eminence and modernism, where we want religion to conform to ourselves or our own dispositions. Let's face it, to remain disciplined, to do what we need to do to always handle God in a proper fashion, 
to always address him in the proper way requires self-denial self -denial of discipline. And that's precisely what's collapsed in the church because everything is so sloppy now in the liturgy. And so people just don't even care how these things are actually even handled. Obviously, there's a segment of the popula Catholic population that doesn't even believe in the real presence. Um, I think the, at, the, at last... At last statistic, I, although I'm open to correction, 60% of the Catholics don't believe it and 40% of the priests don't believe in the real presence. Well, if that's actually the case, then you're not going to think this thing is, ni ni like, is not like nitroglycerin and you're just going to treat it like common bread because then in your mindset, that's actually what it actually is. But that doesn't change the reality of it. So even though God might, if the person doesn't have faith or if there's, and it's not you know, and God recognizes, okay, this person obviously has no clue. It doesn't mean that even in the handling of it, objectively speaking, he's not slighted, okay? So this uh, presence then requires a discipline on our part where we keep our affections down, our mind focus, and our wills, you know, in acts of love and relationship to the thing because that's what he's actually deserving, when it comes time to come up for preparation for Holy Communion, this should be the thing that's actually predominant. And so the Holy Communion is, you're just about to consume the thing that's keeping the entire universe in existence, right? And so there has to be a disposition or an attitude of true reverence. And by reverence, we mean respect or recognition of the honor that is due to this and a proper retreatment that is due to this, this thing that we're about to consume, right? So there should be a proper disposition. It shouldn't be, you know, pulling your gum out right before you go up or walking around, you know, looking around, looking at, and, you know, patting Bessie Sue on the back, you know, et cetera, as you're walking up. It should be a tire, entirely singular focus on him and him alone, okay? Then, as you come up to the, uh, so there should be prayers. The prayer, if you're following along with Mass, there is already some preparatory prayers that can actually be, begin that process. But as the priest receives communion and before he starts distributing communion, there should be some interior, at least meditation, if not specific uh, prayers that you can say mentally to dispose yourself to the proper reception of, of Holy Communion. There should, in other words, there should be the remote preparation, which is the mass and being reverent during that, and then the proximate preparation, which is right before you receive Holy Communion, there should be a, a disposition that has to be properly fostered once you get to that point. Okay. The, um, if you look at what this actually is, then, if this is the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of God, of Christ, then this basically means that if you're going to receive it, so if you're talking about something that is, is infinitely good, then what's due in proportionate to that is an infinite goodness, right? Now, the problem is, is that we can't provide that on, in a certain, we can't provide that in a certain way. However, when we're approaching for Holy Communion to this infinite good, if we're in the state of grace, then God is indwelling in our souls so that when we actually perform the action, it's not infinite in the proper sense, but it does have a certain kind of infinitude in the sense that it's proceeding from something that has God dwelling in it, and so there's a kind of a proportion. So when you look at um, the receiving of Holy Communion, this is, this is one of the foundational reasons why the church has always said, you must be in the state of grace. The church for its entire tradition has always said that if you receive Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin, it's sacrilege and it's a mortal sin. And the only other sin that's worse than that, the church has said, is final impenitence or uh, the um, uh, sin against the Holy Spirit, which is final impenitence. That's the only other thing that's worse. So this is the, this is the, and by worse, we're talking about as two effects, not necessarily in its nature. This is, con this sacrilege and receiving it not in the state of grace is considered the most heinous of all things that people can actually do. And so that's because when you're receiving Holy Communion, you're receiving it unworthily. Now we actually saw this in the, um, in the Gospels 
the guy goes to the wedding feast, he's not properly dressed. No, the dress is actually reference to sanctifying grace in the soul, and so he gets thrown out. Now, this is a twofold um, reference. One is uh, in relationship to in heaven. You can't get into heaven unless you're in the state of grace, second of all. And so if that's the case, then why should you be approaching something which basically is making heaven presence by it being there, that is the Eucharist? But the other thing is, is in relationship to the Eucharist, you can't come to the wedding feast, which is the Eucharist, unless you're in the state of grace. You shouldn't, I mean, you can go to mass, but you can't come up and eat because you're not in the actual state of grace. And you're, you're spiritually dead at that point, and you wouldn't give food to something that's dead, right? And so this is something, although today, although today people might do that. Uh, the point being is, is that this is, there's a, a, a proportion in justice here that this is, and it's, a, it's, it's a rooted in a kind of a decorum, and decorum is when the two sides of the equation fit each other, right? So if, if the, um, you, know, you know something doesn't fit because of the, is, in, uh, is indecorous because it doesn't actually fit. So, you know, if you're in the presence of, you know, a bishop and some guy is carrying on like a buffoon, well, the bishop is a serious individual uh, as far as his power goes. And so how you behave in his presence should be proportionate to that. It should fit that particular thing. Well, it's the same thing here in relationship to receiving Holy Communion. Being in the state of grace makes you a fit receiver of that thing which is infinitely good. And so there is a proportion of a sense. It's not an absolute, but it's as good as we can, that we're capable of having as creatures. And so there ha you have to be in the state of grace. Again, the church has always said, if you're not in the state of grace, you don't go to communion. Now, some pe you will hear uh, some priests say, oh, well, if you're embarrassed, you can still go up. That is not what the tradition has said. The tradition has said that the only time that you can receive communion in the state of mortal sin is if grave scandal would result in your not receiving Holy Communion. Outside that context, they said you are forbidden to receive Holy Communion. And this is something that's very key. Everybody just trapes up and gets Holy Communion like it's nothing, right? And this is, and then people, oh, by the way, the, the, one of the things that you're seeing today is that people are engaging in things that are mortally sinful and their attitude is, well, I don't think it's morally sinful, so I can go to communion. Now, that's not how this works, right? Your obligation is to conform yourself to the objective teachings what the church proposes. And if you're not conforming to that, you shouldn't be really receiving Holy Communion either, right? Until you get this cleaned up or straightened out, okay? So all that being said, you have to be in the state of grace. If you're not in the state of grace, it's morally sinful receive Holy Communion, and each time you do it, you have to confess that. This is something that most people don't confess, even though they're often receiving communion in the state of mortal sin. They're not confessing it. Okay. The other part of it is, too, is, is that there is a secondary kind of proportion, and that is because you're dealing with an object that is God, who's infinitely good, and reception of Holy Communion, it means that the state of your soul... that there are various facets of the state of your soul that go into consideration in its relationship to this infinite good. The state of your soul includes the state of grace, first and foremost. You have to be in the state of grace. But then also, part of the state of your soul is all of the, la the, all of the virtues and lack of virtues that you might have in your soul. So that if you're going to receive something that's infinite good, infinitely good, it would mean that your soul, sh you should be at least striving for the eradication of every single imperfection before you approach it, so the uh, Holy Communion, so that your soul is the op most optimally prepared for its reception in the most suitable fashion. And we know this to actually be the case because the more virtuous we are, the more devout we're going to be, the more we're going to have the proper dispositions, the more modest we're going to be when we go up. All those virtues are going to put in place so that when we receive it, the lower faculties and all the faculties are in a proper place as they're contemplating receiving the, the Holy Eucharist. 
Now, the church has said you don't have to have perfect virtue, obviously, to receive Holy Communion, because if you did, nobody would. But that you do have to at least be in the state of grace, and you should be work and but you should be working on the dispositions prior to even coming to Mass. You should be trying to eradicate these things before you even receive Holy Communion. When you come up to Holy Communion, then that means there should be decorum and proper virtue manifested in the proper coming up to receive Holy Communion. Now, part of fear of the Lord is a desire not to offend them. Now, here is something that we have to put into perspective. The church, in its wisdom, historically, got to the point where reception of communion, this is before the Second Vatican Council, was received kneeling and on the tongue. And there's two components to this. The first is people always say, well, the tongue is, uh, some of you might have heard me this weekend, you know, the tongue is, they say, well, the tongue is not any more of a recept, re, uh, a, a suitable organ to receive the Eucharist than the hands are, right? Well, the problem is, is that if you, if you uh, get baptized in the new rite, that's actually true because there's actually nothing that's really done in the old rite. There, they, there's actually exercise salt that's placed on the tongue of the individual and a prayer is said, it's basically a form of exorcism, to exercise the tongue to make it a fit organ of reception. This is what, so in other words, and it even says in, the, in that prayer, may this, uh, may, this, may this salt be a foretaste of the heavenly food. So there's a preparation for the tongue to receive the Holy Communion, not the hands. The priest's hands are consecrated. That's why he can properly touch them. Okay, And so the, historically, the church prepared the person by exercising their tongue and then had them kneel. Now, why do you actually kneel with your hands folded? And uh, there is a, a, a... Originally, in the early church, they actually did receive communion in the hand. But, they, but once the church got to a certain point, they stopped that practice entirely and went to this other one because it's more suitable, it's more reverent, and it also, there's less sacrilege, there's a whole series of reasons as to why the church actually did that. And so they, uh, and you'll hear theologians say, oh, well, we're adults, so we should stand. Oh, shut up, you know, is what I want to tell them. You know, if that, then, you know, if it, the, the whole thing is so daft, you know, is, is, is that by implication mean that only kids grovel or that only kids kneel? I mean, that's just stupid. That doesn't even make any sense. The reason you kneel, the position of kneeling is a position of servitude. That's why you kneel in relationship to somebody. It's actually, ironically, why the guy kneels to the woman before he proposes. It's a sign of, I will serve you in marriage. I'm willing to serve you in marriage. That's what it's actually referenced for. But the reason that you actually kneel is to take a lower position than the person above, to recognize their higher state than yours. So it's a matter of decorum, and it's also a matter of, it's part of the virtue, again, of modesty that St. Thomas talks about, which is um, equality to a stable authority is part of this. Uh, it's a virtue, it's a sub-virtue to modesty. And basically what that means is that my actions are proportionate to this thing this person that's above me, and so there should be an automatic lowering. We, you know, people say, oh, well, we're God's friends. Yes, we are, but we're still his servants, right? And we, he owns us. We are his property. And it also means that by taking that position of servitude, he's more likely to grant us what we're asking. And that's because of the fact that God loves humility and wants, and the fact that we humble ourselves in relationship to him makes it makes us more pleasing in his sight and what we're doing more pleasing to him in his sight we are his slaves this is also another reason why you know our hands should not be held out our hands shouldn't be extended like the our father think they should you know it should be actually folded which is the sign again of servitude you actually see this even in the rite of ordination during the rite of ordination after the the priest folds his hands in a form of servitude, places them in the hands of the bishop who's on the outside, which is a sign of holding the person's ser 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 uh, servitude in place. And it's at that point that he promises obedience, which is what? Submitting our wills to his. And so this is, 
And this is one of the reasons why you fold it because it's actually a sign of servitude and a willing to submit to the will of God in relationship to this. The fact that people today want their hands all extended, hands open up, they want to do this, they want to do that with their hands is an indicator that we've lost any semblance of humility, we've lost any sense of our servitude to God, we've lost any sense of who and what we actually are in relationship to, we've lost decorum. So we should actually take a position of inferiority in relationship to him. You're literally, and when the priest holds the blessed sacrament up to give you Holy Communion, you're literally standing in the presence or you should be kneeling in the presence of something that is infinitely above you. Therefore, standing is not an appropriate position. It should be kneeling is the appropriate position because it recognizes we are below him, not equal to him, not above him, we are, we are below him. And then, so our knees, and, and we even see this, Christ even says both, you know, before, before Christ, every knee shall bow. We read that in scripture. And so there should be a recognition that we are below him. That should also be reflected in our own interior state, that we are below him and that what he's about to bequeath to us, which is himself, is a pure gift. We are not, even though we might be in the state of grace, he has no obligation to give this thing to us. He has no obligation to, to bequeath this to us. The very fact that he does it is astounding, right? It's just a sign of his pure generosity to us. And so we kneel down, and then we ha our hands should be folded. And part of the communion rail, we'll do, go into a little bit of that. The communion rail, people, you know, they got rid of the communion rail. Well, the communion rail, in every sacrifice, there's three elements. There's the offertory. And that's what we, the, pre, the people offer up the mass in union with the, with the actions of the priest. There's the slaying of the victim. That's the actual consecration in relationship to the people in the pew. They should be willing to die to themselves before they go to the communion rail. And then the last is the consuming of the victim. And so the priest consumes it to complete the ritualistic side of the mass. But the, and, and he does that at the altar. Then there is the secondary altar, which is the communion rail. That's the, that is the altar of the laity. They go up and then they receive and kneel at the altar that is the communion rail and receive Holy Communion. This is one of the reasons why there's a lot of times a, uh, a communion corporal, which is symbolic of the corporals that are also on the altar, but it's also sometimes to collect the particles, etc. And so, and we uh, kneel down, head back, tongue out, and the tongue is because it's a more fit reception of um, uh, a recept organ because it's been exercised. If you've been baptized in the old rite, the priest then gives you the communion. And then, of course, there should be, uh, you should get up and then go back to your pew. And it's at that time that you should be really focusing on Christ that's in you. Historically, they said that the most efficacious time for anyone to pray is immediately after they received Holy Communion. The general rule of thumb is that the Eucharist remains in the individual probably for about 15 minutes, probably more or less. And so it's during that time, that first 15 minutes after the reception of communion, that the theologians often said that the prayers of the laity are the most efficacious because they have God in them, both in the case of sanctifying grace, but also substantially present in the Eucharist before the accidents of the bread dissipate and then therefore the um, presence of God uh, ceases. So there, uh, that presence of God in that moment means that their prayers to him are going to be far more efficacious in that first 15 minutes. Okay. Now normally, unless you have like a, a particular kind of sung mass, the... Uh, uh, or a, a solemn high mass where from the time of reception of communion to the time it's done is extraordinarily long. Normally speaking, that means like if you're at a low mass, you, the priest is going to be done in about five minutes and that means you have 10 more minutes that you really should be doing a, a, a matter of thanksgiving. Part of just good manners and good morals and virtue of gratitude, which is part of the virtue of justice according to St. Thomas, is that when somebody gives us a good thing, we express, St. Thomas says, we say thank you or we express thanks to them in some manner because he says expressing the thanks is a form of giving the person honor for the excellence of the good that they had given to you and the manifestation of their excellence in their benignity towards you. This is precisely why there's that dynamic and that structure. And so we should honor them by 
and, and he says basically thank you as a form of praise. You're praising and thank you for the good thing that you've given to me. We should be going back to the communion after the after communion. We should be going back to our pew and praying for from the time we receive Holy Communion for roughly 15 minutes. You know, and so if, obviously if you have to if you have obligations, that's another matter. But the fact that people just receive Holy Communion like they do a snack and then afterwards they're just yakking it up is an indicator that if God is present in them, that they have a complete disregard for his presence. And so there should be kind of a general recognition that from the time of the receiving of Holy Communion, there should be at least 15 minutes of, um, of thanksgiving. In fact, if I remember right, I'm open to correction in this, but in the old code of canon law, the priest had an obligation to spend 15 minutes in thanksgiving after every mass. Now, for some priests, it became very difficult, especially if you're doing masses and confessions and things like that. And the church did recognize legitimate exceptions. But there was always a 15-minute time frame that the church expected to do it. After, in the new code, they just said he should be basically um, spend a suitable or an adequate amount of time in Thanksgiving afterwards. But uh, before, it was like it was that 15-minute kind of hallmark. And this, this gratitude is very important because God is not any different than we are the more thankful and appreciative someone is of the gift that we give them, the more likely we are to give it to them in the future and the more likely we are to give them even greater gifts in the future. Whereas if they just take it and then they just walk off, there's no gratitude, there's no nothing, eventually we're just gonna pull the plug on it and not give it to them because of the fact that they're sliding us, right? So there should be a proper um, Thanksgiving afterwards um, each time we receive Holy Communion. And it should be something that is, again, devout, reflecting on God's presence in some fashion, um, saying prayers and gratitude towards Him for having given us this to us. All of this means that we have to have proper decorum and reverence. Now, again, reverence is respect for the, uh, and honor given to something um, because of its nature or position or what have you. And so we should be, be very reverential in relationship to the Eucharist. I just want to talk about a couple of other things. Historically, the church is an attitude of reverence and this whole thing of that I've talked about where there's fear of the Lord in addressing the Eucharist was in virtually every single one of its rituals that had, had to do with the, uh, the Blessed Sacrament. For example... As soon as the, um, uh, the priest would, oh, once the offertory was actually done, anytime the pall was actually taken off the host, the priest had to place his finger on the chalice to stabilize it for the sake of fear of if it spilled, there would be sacrilege. Once then, of course, the, um, there's the consecration. And so each time that the, the, the pall is taken on or put off, there's this care that is actually given it. Even in the, um, when you take the, uh, sometimes you, you can't always do this, but even when it comes from taking the patent and placing the host on the patent, the rubrics actually state that you're supposed to slide the patent underneath the, the host without even touching it. And it's, and why? Because you haven't genuflected yet. You haven't shown it a sign of reverence yet. Once it's underneath then you take the pall off, then you genuflect, then you can touch it. So in the old rite, both before and after, every single time you touch the Blessed Sacrament or deal with it in any fashion, um, like in relationship to the, to the host, you genuflect before and after as a sign of reverence, right? So there's a profound sense of, of fear of the Lord and also reverence in relationship to this thing it built into the actual Mass. The manner of giving communion was reverential, etc. There was not this just sloppiness with everybody handling it, etc. Then... The church, this is something that most people don't know. Before the Second Vatican Council, I think it might even be in the Code of Canon Law, the old code, but I'd have to take a look at it. But the practice of the church was you could not have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament um, except for certain days of the year where it was liturgically permitted or prescribed. And But if you did it outside that context... You had to have explicit permission from the local bishop to expose the Blessed Sacrament. Why? Well, the basic reason being is, is because once you expose the Blessed Sacrament, God in all his glory is manifest. 
And so our approach to that should be one of profound humiliation, profound reverence and deference. It should be profound, we should, there should be a profundity to it. And in, this is one of the reasons why in the old rite, once the Blessed Sacrament was exposed, you could do prayers to the Blessed Sacrament. There were certain things that you could actually do. You could meditate, obviously, once it was exposed. But this business of exposing the Blessed Sacrament and going off and doing the all, uh, office was absolutely forbidden. Or this business of exposing the Blessed Sacrament and walking over and preaching was absolutely forbidden because, it's a, again, it's a slight to God. Here you've got the most... You've got the infinite good in all its magnificence and glory to the degree that we can even comprehend and see or experience in this life, and you're just ignoring it and going off and doing something else. It's a slight, right? And it's immodest, and it's inappropriate. Also, this is one of the reasons why the church always said that whenever the Blessed Sacrament was exposed, there had to be at least two people present. One is to protect the thing, which is one of the primary reasons. But the other is, you know, if a king comes out in, in all the splendor of his garments and everything and sits on, the, sits on a throne, if everybody just got up and walked out, you'd think there's something fundamentally wrong with these people that they just slighted the king this way. Well, there's no difference between that and what we see in the Blessed Sacrament. I personally think the church has to start tightening that stuff back up. Now, I'll end it with this, and then we can go to questions. People say, well, we need to, we actually, you know, should I actually go and spend some time in front of the Blessed Sacrament? Well, yeah, if it's there, I think you could. I think you should. I just think the practice of the church needs to be tightened up a bit to maintain that deference and that, um, that uh, reverence for the Blessed Sacrament. But, um, and so I, you know, I don't have any problem. I'll even do it myself from time to time. I just think it should be le done less uh, frequently. Um, but anyway, all that being said, and I think that, the, I do think that there is a argument, which I think is actually true, that they said the reason there's so much exposition, the reason people are spending, they're being drawn to spend so much time in exposition now because, is because of the new mass in which there's virtually no reverence, there's no um, quiet time, there's no adoration during the thing because it's just all talking. And then it, the church, the mass starts. Then there's the talking. There's a communion, and then the church and the thing ends, and everybody's jacking it up. There's no meditation, and so the devotion, the natural inclination we have to have a profound devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, isn't being fulfilled in the new rite in the way that it's um, generally um, done. Whereas in the old rite, they said because it's done in silence, you know, and the whole nature of the um, there's, a, there's time during the old rite in which we are capable of contemplating the Blessed Sacrament as it's sitting on the altar in quiet and in recollection. Because of that, at least the lay people are, because of that, there's less of a drive very often among traditional Catholics to have this, you know, wanting to have this exposition all the time. It's not that we don't like exposition. We love exposition. It just means that there is a, what's happening is, is that the church is compensating for the, la the lack of reverence and the, um, de fulfill the fulfillment of devotion in the Mass by having the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass. And so I think that, that, whereas in the old rite, it seems to be less of an issue. I mean, again, that we love exposition, but we don't feel the absolute drive and necessity of doing it. We also will be go and we can actually go to a church and spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament and we find a certain kind of contentment as traditional Catholics without it having to be exposed. There's some people who just, they don't even want to go unless it's exposed. So you can kind of get that. The point I'm drawing in in all of this is that if we honestly believe that this thing that is sitting on the altar mm -hmm. is God, our disposition, meaner, and attitude should be fundamentally different than what we're seeing in the modern church. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Um, at one time, uh, Tony and I saw uh, a priest do mass with the with, uh, Blessed Sacrament exposed in a monstrance and, and you had written back to me saying there were two times in the year that that's... Yeah. Can you tell us what those times of the year are? Um, yeah, it's uh, Monday, Thursday, because it's partially exposed for part of the Mass. And then also the Feast of um, 
uh, Corpus Christi. Outside that context, uh, you're not supposed to say the whole Mass in front of the Blessed Sacrament, though, at least if I remember the rubrics correctly in the Old Rite. It was only allowed to be exposed for the, for the uh, finishing of the Mass because immediately after the Mass, you're going to have processions. It normally should not be out for the whole mass. Not to my my understanding is is that um, the Vatican said no to that. So, and being part of that is there's a whole series of rubrics that you have to do even when it's exposed for part of the mass. Yeah. Yes. Some of them don't. They right. don't want them to spend any time with them because the first thing they do after they distribute Holy Communion is get somebody up to the pulpit and start gabbing about something else. Yes, that's right. all these announcements and these other things. Yeah. So you can't even make, you have no time to spend with Christ unless you're the first one yeah. up to communion. Um, why do you think that is? And then they complain about no one believing. Well, they have precipitated that themselves yeah, they by have. their actions. They have, yeah. They have taken him away from them. They caused distraction, disruption within within the their parishioners' souls. I, I just, yeah. well, I just virtually every yeah. Well, virtually everything that they've actually done in the new right has, has kind of begot that particular problem right, where people just don't have any reverence or care for it. So let me, um, so, uh, you know, a part, there's a couple of things that kind of come to mind as you're talking about. One of the things that they actually do is, one of the things that they actually do is in some parishes, after everybody's received communion, nobody's allowed to kneel yet until everybody else receives communion, right? And then what they try and do is they try and impose this artificial quiet time. It's artificial. It's not built into the nature of the rite where, well, after the communion, you know, you should sit and meditate on for a while. Well, why? You should have been meditating on it the whole time. Right? And also the lay people wouldn't have to be worrying about being able to meditate after they received Holy Communion if what the priest was actually, uh, you know, if, if everything wasn't, as soon as the communion's done, everybody's yakking again. Which is in the old rite, there's the, you know, there's the whole preparation, there's the post-communion, or there's the communion and the post-communion. So there's kind of this lead up back to where we go from the meditation to reception of communion, you know, another meditation back to the normal vocal prayer. So there's kind of a, a fluidity to the whole thing. But I also think that ultimately it goes back to the fact that the priests themselves don't believe it. I mean, the 40%. And even if they do believe it, they don't even know how to handle this thing. You know, when you, if you'll even hear them say, well, it's a little bit over the top what they used to do in the old rite. Really? You know, let's go back to the, let's, let's, just stay, let's just say for the sake of argument, we find a bomb. Something that has the ability to kill all of us is sitting in the middle of this room. Are you going to allow just whoever thinks that it's good for them to be giving to be dismantling this bomb of dismantling the bomb? You'd be saying, no, 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 no. You're going to find out who knows the most about this bomb or who's the most suited to dissemble this bomb before you ever allow the person to even approach the thing. And then when he approaches it, he's going to be dressed properly and he's going to be doing. You know, he's going to be in certain kinds of things to minimize the blast and do and doing all this. And yet. For some reason or another, when it comes to God, we're so prone as human beings to easily offend him, so prone to it. And again, you get these people, well, God understands. Yeah, he understands we easily offend him. That's what he understands. And so we should have, we should, it should be done in such a manner that only, obviously only the priest whose hands are consecrated, that the church has to restrict and regulate this thing very heavily. Because otherwise, as you've heard me say, if you leave the liturgy to the discretion of the priests, Priests are stupid, and you're going to end up with stupid liturgy. And that's exactly what we're seeing. It has to be regulated by the church. And, but this also means that 
It's the very ritual itself has led people to th in the new right to, to be careless in relationship to it. It's interesting because when you see priests make the transition from saying the, old, the new right to saying the old right, when they were in the new right, they wanted reverence in it, so it had to be added on top of the ritual already. It wasn't something that just naturally flowed from the ritual. If you just did what the ritual said, the reverence would automatically be built in. They had to impose it from the outside. And a lot of times that also comes in the form in which how they say the prayers. They say them very slow and very deliberately. And then they're, they're doing, you know, and it's, it's all to impose this artificial reverence on top of something that just doesn't have it as much by nature. Then when you get to the old, when they come and start saying the old right, they bring those habits with them. So it literally takes, and uh, from the St. Thomas, St. Alphonsus of Liguria, all the way through Pius XII, they said manifold to manifold 30, 30 minutes. And basically what that means is, is if your Latin is decent and you can focus and you're doing it properly, you can, be, once it becomes habit, you can say the Mass and be completely focused on God and the things that are occurring in the liturgy without having to impose all this stuff on it. Um, and so their, their masses sometimes take an hour to an hour and a half when they're first starting because they're trying to impose this artificiality on it. And it's not until they begin to realize, no, the mass itself contains it. You don't need to add it, right? And so this is that, okay, so why am I going into all this? It basically means that in the new rite, because the mass is so, um, is, is, is such that the reverence has to be artificially imposed on top of it, most priests aren't just going to do that. They don't have the gas, and most of them aren't reverent by nature anyway, and so they're just not going to do it. And so it leads to this carelessness. Then, of course, they're allowing lay people to receive to give out Holy Communion. They're allowing everybody to receive it on the hand. They're allowing, and you just go down the litany of the, and they allow the the um, the uh, precious body and blood of Christ to be taken from the altar, which historically would have been just, other than to give out for communion, would have been considered absolutely forbidden, you know, be, uh, to, in order to do the purification off on the side. You know, none of that would have ever been tolerated in the past because every time you do that, what are you doing? You're basically telling God that you can, that, you know, the deacon can take it off to a side credence table and do the purification. You're basically telling God that you're not worth our time. We're going to take you off and put you on a side table and let some other guy clean you up while we go back to our yakking. That's essentially what you're saying in that. People just don't seem to get that their actions have intrinsic meanings, and this is what we're telling God every time we do it. It doesn't matter what you think you're telling him. Objectively, this is what actually happens. If I actually think that I'm helping you by brushing that fly off of your face, and I felt the living daylights out of you, and I think to myself, well, I did you a favor by getting that fly off your face. It's still belting, objectively. And this is, what, this is what we have to realize is that the liturgy has objective content. And so the point I'm trying to get into this, and I didn't mean to get into kind of a rant, is the fact that the lack of belief is due to the behavior of the priest, the ritual not by its nature fostering and being very careful in how it handles the sacred species, and the, just the general laissez-faire attitude we have towards the Eucharist. And so this is just bound to happen. The answer is actually yes. When you listen to them, they'd say, well, it's not appropriate that the priest has his back towards the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you hear what you just said? You're saying Mass with your back to God. You're not even thinking about what you just said. You know, and this is the thing that gets me about these people. You know, it's, it's like I mentioned the other day. You know, it, the, the, in fact, you know, this one, Cardinal says, well... You know, even if the priest says Mass facing the people, he still should be interiorly saying Mass facing God. Well, you've just split the priest down the middle. Here we live at a time. You used to hear people, these modernist theologians say, 
all the time. Oh, the church before the council was Gnostic because it would split people up, you know. You know, they just, they, they acted like we were angels and this and that and this and that. And then that's exactly, this is angelology where what I'm doing interiorly has nothing to do with what my body is doing. That's just nutty, right? And so the point I'm drawing out in this is that um, the, so to get that, to get to it, so that's actually why they ended up, that's one of the reasons they wanted to remove the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, it's probably the principal reason. But the other reason is, is they just wanted to dethrone him. The modernists have a visceral hatred for what is sacred. And so they want to get rid of it. And so they wanted to move it off to the side or out. And think, historically, the only time the Blessed Sacrament was off on the side is under two circumstances. One is if you had a chapel where there was an extraordinary amount of traffic. So like St. Peter's, one time I'm kneeling in St. Peter's and it's the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. So I'm there up in the front of the church because they have the Chair of St. Peter there and I'm kneeling there. And this guy comes up to me and says, you know, do you speak English? I said, yeah. And he says, what do you, what do you think of the fact that they moved the Blessed Sacrament from the front of this church to the side? And I said, historically, it's never been in the front of St. Peter's. It's always been in the side. And the reason being is because there's way too much traffic. The second, the only other second time, which also St. Peter's meets this requirements, is that it was done in a cathedral church because it was done in a cathedral church. The chair of the bishop who had the fullness of priesthood would very often sit in the center of the, uh, in the center as, um, because it's, he's the perfect representation of Christ except for the Eucharist, of course. And the Eucharist was very often in, in cathedral churches in those situations, again, off to the side because there was so much traffic. And they just didn't want sacrilege and disrespect to actually end up occurring. Then what happened is, over the course of time, you started seeing it in this country. You saw it, you saw it in Europe, too. But you started seeing that even in the cathedrals, they started putting in these massive high altars and having the Blessed Sacrament in the center. And then the bishop would actually be sitting to the right of Christ. So if you're actually looking at the Blessed Sacrament, the, the bishop was over on, this, on the right-hand side. And I think that's a legitimate liturgical development. In fact, I actually prefer that to the other one, even though I recognize that the other one actually has a historical precedence. And the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament was not something that was... Um, that commonplace, for example, in the early church anyway. So it, was, it, it didn't have the same kind of a meaning. But after it got moved to the front, and in, in smaller churches it was always in the front, the reason they got rid of it is because they hated it. I mean, I hate to say that, but they didn't. They wanted to put man in the place of God. So if I don't know if I ever showed this to you, but if you actually look at... Um, if you actually look at a Freemasonic temple, it's actually in this format where there is the part where the um, ritual takes place and none of it has an altar rail or any demarcation other than a step. And then they have an altar here in the middle and then in the back is where the Worshipful Grand Master sits. And then he has two, uh, he had, he's flanked by two uh, assistants. And then over here is a place where parts of the ritual are actually read. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. It's a new right church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is actually one of the, uh, um, this is actually one of the th reasons why I think that we, we saw part of that ushered in. But part of it just has to do with they just have a visceral hatred. And of course the Freemasons, um, are Luciferian, so when you get to the top, you become your own god type of thing, at least that's what they want to think. Um, and so you can see why they would put man here in the place of God. And I think that's actually what we're actually seeing in most churches. Yeah. Um, in uh, our little church, there's a family um, that responds with every single altar server response during the low mass right. at, at one o'clock. And right. I know, is it is it now? Uh, a priest taught us before, before, a few years ago that uh, nine a.m. is when you can respond. High mass, you respond, but any other low mass of the day, mm -hmm. you're to be silent. Correct. Okay, so this was like you know the second low mass of the day. Um, 
how, how uh, it was extremely distracting. <laughs> so yeah. how 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 do you address that through the pastor through what you know just uh, you know. Well, um, uh, I think there's a couple of things first. Is let me just do a little bit of a history thing here. Historically, if you actually look at the original, the most early um, missiles are sacramentaries. They actually talk about the people making the responses. So this is in the first, uh, probably about three or four centuries in the church that they people would actually make the responses, etc. But then over the course of time, as the rit by the time you get to Gregory the Great, where the, the ritual is codified in about 600, more or less, you have, um, in fact, we don't know the exact dates, but we know it's about 600 because it's during his pontificate, um, which was from uh, 595 to 607, if I remember correctly. By the time you get to that, there's been a series of developments in the liturgy where there's a layering that starts to happen within the liturgy. So basically what you have is, you have, um, and it's it's actually based it's actually based on a cathedral church, really, if you look at it. So you have the lay people, which is the lowest um, level in which things were the prayer was actually occurring, and then you had the um, communion rail, and then you had the choir, which was singing. That's yet another level. So if you look at a high mass, the lay people are praying one thing, and then the um, the choir, which is the choir here is actually referring to a clerical choir, although they're not all that way now, which is actually one of the reasons because they weren't all clerical choirs, they actually moved it to the back of the church up above the lay people to still try and maintain that semblance of, of hierarchy. So, and this is what basically what's happening. You have this hierarchy. So here's the line of demarcation. Then you have the choir here. Then you have the servers. Then you have the deacon, the subdeacon, and up to the priest. So there's this layering of a hierarchy all the way up to the top, right? And so the communion rail played a very important point because it was the dividing line between the sacred and the profane, right? And so, and that, it didn't mean that you, that the lay people were evil or anything like that. It just meant that there was a recognition that this was, a, this was the place of the sacred action and that it was done in a hierarchy because God likes things in a hierarchy. So by the time you get to Gregory the Great and you have pontifical masses and then you have psalm high and, and, and um, sung masses, you have this gradation. And even in a low mass, there is the, the people, the server, and the priest. So there's always a semblance of that at not everything that is going on at the upper level has to be responded to or taking place or acknowledged on the lower level, right? Not even heaven is that way. This is supposed to be a resemblance of heaven, right? And the things that are going on on the lower level aren't necessarily what's going on on the upper level. And so there's a recognition that there's things that are just going on in the, with the priest that is simply not in relationship to the, um, that's not going on. And, and with the server, the server assisting the priest, so there's another uh, step down. And then there's, and then of course the server at a certain point um, actually makes the responses on behalf of the people. So there's this hierarchy that's maintained. Well, what happens is, so that that is the progression that you happen to see in theology. It remains in place until the 19 teens and 20s in France and Germany. At that point, the modernists, once they stopped purging the seminaries and universities of the modernists, the modernists realized you could basically go into liturgy or make liturgical statements and things about the liturgy that are essentially contrary to what the church has always done and the development and all of that, but they're not technically speaking against theology. And so you could start pushing for things that were basically non-Catholic or contrary to the Catholic faith or deleterious of the Catholic liturgy and all of that by going into liturgy and making these statements. So what happens is they start encouraging in France, in Germany, to start doing what they call the dialogue mass, which is you basically remove the altar rail, psychologically speaking. The fact that it's removed later is just the result of the dialogue mass in my book. You remove this thing psychologically because now the lay people are sucked up into the function that the server is actually doing, and they're making the responses with all of the servers. The Vatican comes back and says, knock it off. It's an abuse. You have to stop that. Well, they kept pushing it. So by the time you get to the 30s, it's widespread in Germany and in France. It's virtually nowhere in the United States at this point. 
so, which is why you tend to see it less in the United States. Then what happens is, because of it, it, it has the same pedigree as altar girls. You know, it's an abuse, it was started, eventually they caved. Well, it's the same thing that happened here. Then by the time you get to Pius XII, he caves on it and said, if you're going to do that, then this is how it has to be done. Right? So the whole time they're telling you, you should, this is an abuse, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, and then they ended up tolerating it. Right? And then they basically said, so there's four levels of the dialogue mass. But the lowest level means you have to make all the responses of the people. Right? Okay, now here's the thing, all the responses of the servers. Right? And that's the lowest level. So the, the people should be making the responses. All the, the problem with that is, and this is one of the reasons why um, Americans really, the American um, traditional clergy, by and large, rebelled against it is because they knew this whole history and the pedigree and where it leads, right? And so and the other thing is, too, is if you're, if you're ever a priest, because I've had to say mass where that is in place, it's absolutely cacophonous because what happens is there's always, you know, some schmuck who sits in the second pew on the right-hand side on the edge, and his, his, he's screaming the responses out at a different tempo than everyone else is doing it. And he does it over and over and over and over again, and you can't shut him up. You talk to him about it, he won't change, he keeps doing it, and so by the time you're done, that symmetry that's actually set up like at the, the prayers at the foot of the altar, where the priest says his line and the service says his line, so it's just like this symmetry that occurs. It's all cattywampus. You're literally sitting there, you'll say your thing, and then here you are as a priest. Because you've got to wait five minutes for everybody to finish that last person all the way in the back of the church to finish their, their saying the thing. And then you say your line. Then It destroys the tempo, right? This is exactly what the modernists wanted. They exactly wanted to suck the lay people up into the sanctuary. They wanted to do all of this stuff, and they were the ones who started this stuff. So now when the, when the um, traditional mass gets, and so in the United States, this thing virtually never took off. There was only a couple places. They tried to push it in a few places, and it just failed miserably, except for in maybe a few ethnic parishes. Then when they try and get this thing back up off the ground, a lot of the people, from a priest from France and that type of stuff, tried to push this stuff again, and the American people will have nothing of it. By and large, there's a couple places where it was done, it still is done, but by and large, they just didn't want it. The point I'm going into all of this is that it was, uh, and so basically, it's the priest's job who's to tell people, first of all, I, if I, in every place I've ever gone, I killed it. Because I just, I, what I'll do is I'll get up on the pulpit and say, this is the pedigree of this thing. And as soon as people realize it's the very thing that begot the new mass, they all don't want anything of it, right? The second part of it is, um, then I, and I also tell them that, you know, we're just not going to do it because it's too cacophonous and it actually lengthens out the mass and this and that. You go down the whole litany of everything that uh, it, it does. But it's actually, it was the crack in the dam. That was the first thing that really got started pushed in the liturgy that began the dissolution of the liturgy historically in my book. Because it got, it, it, it basically... It was a modernist mindset of a lot. They didn't want any distinction between the clerical, which is representation of God and the people. They wanted the people to be God. They wanted the people to be doing everything. They wanted the people to be part of the ministers because why? They wanted to level the clerical state because the clerical state is a sacred thing and they hated it. So they wanted rid of all of that stuff. And so this, is the, this was the beginning where the, personally, if I was Pius XII, I would say the next bishop that does not within the week shut that down, he loses his office. I'm yanking him. I'm deposing him. And just start doing it and clean that mess up. But they didn't, and so now it's just it mushroomed. So the point being is, is that it's up to the priest to tell them what if, the, if they're going to do it, because the Vatican says you can because it was permissible in 1962, and they're not restricting it. But by and large, I think it's not a good liturgical practice. But if they're going to do it, then the priest is the one who has to say, these are the rules, and this is what you actually have to do. Okay. Yes? Should people approach the communion rail if they're not going to receive the Eucharist? Mm. In the new rite, people attending Mass who are not Catholic or in a state of grace have been encouraged to come up for a blessing. 
Correct. Um, and then they should also come approach with a universal sign on, I'm not in a state of rage with their arms crossed. All right. I'm not receiving. Yeah. Right. Isn't the final blessing by the priest a higher blessing because it's written into the Mass that they don't need to go up? Yeah, that's a good point. It actually is. But the other thing is, too, is this very question was actually posed. There was a German priest. There's a general principle. You, you never ask Rome a question for which you don't already know the answer. Because in the end, you just never know what you're going to get. Now, there was a phase there um, uh, before the axing of the... Um, there was a phase there, though, before the axing of uh, the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Day, where the answers coming out of Rome were very solid, very well thought out, very rooted in the tradition. And I'm like, well, this is pretty good. But that all being said. So th this German guy, these German people write 21 or 24 questions to the Vatican. I'm just like, don't ask. You know, because then they're going to start telling you to do wacky things. Well, th in this case, they actually did something really good. They basically said that to give a blessing to, the, to children or to other people who are not receiving communion at that time is a non-liturgical act taking place in the liturgy and therefore is not, it should not be done, they said. They didn't say you couldn't do it. They just said it shouldn't be being done. Then they said, but if you're going to do it, you can't do it with the Blessed Sacrament, etc. And so the practice just was never really addressed. When I grew up, you didn't go to communion, you didn't go to the communion rail until you rece had received communion. And so really people shouldn't be coming up to the communion rail to receive a blessing. If they want a blessing outside of mass or something like that, fine, come up, we'll be happy to give them to you. But they shouldn't be coming up at that time if they're not receiving communion because the communion rail is for those, as I just got done saying in the conference, the communion rail is the altar of the sacrifice that the lay people are offering where they complete their sacrifice. Well, they're not completing the sacrifice, so they shouldn't be there. Yes? Um, I have witnessed um, a certain, um, like one parishioner, sometimes two, that receive the precious blood yeah. at the end of communion yeah. because of their celiac disease or whatever. Yeah. I'm assuming that's appropriate. This is in the traditional right. Um, okay, I'm going to... Uh, okay. So, historically, if you couldn't tolerate gluten or couldn't tolerate it, the church's attitude was, it's not the will of God that you receive the sacraments. That sacrament. The other thing is, historically, people didn't receive communion every single time they went to Mass anyway. I mean, most people, if they received communion three or four times a year, that was pretty extraordinary. The fact that certain saints or nuns received it every day was, was by exception, right? Now, I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't receive communion if they're not properly disposed in the state of grace and all that. But what, I'm, what, I, my, what my concern is, and this is something which I mentioned quietly to some priests, and I'll just say it publicly now, um, and that is, it's like a menu. People come up to the communion rail and they want, well, I need a low gluten host. I need a no, no gluten host. I need precious blood. I need this. I need that. By the time you're done giving out communion, instead of doing the normal communion and going up and giving up, you've got 15 different forms of communion practically that you're giving out. It's, it's not traditional in any sense of the term. Let me just put it that way. Now, I do want to be able to accommodate people to the degree that we can, but it's just simply not traditional. The other thing is, too, is the only reason they're getting away with giving people the precious blood during Mass is because it's during Mass. It wasn't until Pius X that communion wasn't even given during Mass. The priest received communion, you'd go straight to the, the communion, the post-communion, or you'd do the ablutions, and then you'd go to the communion, the post-communion. He would finish Mass, he would go into the sacristy, he would devest, put on a surplus, put on a stole, come out, whoever remained, then he would do the communion service. That's what was done for 1,500 years. And then what happens is, is Pius X, I think his motivations were good, but in the end it turned out bad. His idea was, we need to get more people going to communion. I agree. 
the solution is not to put it inside a mask because now you have this thing where everybody just thinks it doesn't matter who, if you go to mass, you get to get received communion. <clears throat> and it also creates the problem of historically, if it was outside a mass, if some guy had eaten something or some guy was in the state of moral sin or whatever, he could just peel out and nobody thought a thing of it because 70% of the people weren't even receiving communion anyway. They didn't even think of it. But now if you're the only guy not receiving Holy Communion, everyone's looking at you, or so they think. All right? And my, my attitude is, well, you're not that important. Not everybody's looking at you. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> All right. But the, the point being is, is that I think, I, and I'm not sure what the solution is. Like I said, I think we should accommodate people to the degree that we can. But I think it should remain within the context of the tradition and not be just, you know, let me put you this way. Giving the precious blood in the old rite prior to our current situation, that is, prior to the Second Vatican Council, would have been considered absolutely scandalous and sacrilegious because it was danger the danger of sacrilege was so profound they would say absolutely not. And now we're doing it all the time. Because of walking down the steps and all I mean the I mean, whole yeah. yeah whole, it, it, he's so Safe yeah, the, 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 the precious blood was never taken from the altar for that very reason. And now you just, it's going on on a pretty regular basis. So, yes. Father, with that, um, I have seen it spill more than one time yeah. when they've done that. The other question I have is I'm seeing all kinds of different things when that happens. Or you, you notice it. Sometimes the priest will hold the vessel and it will just touch the person's lips right. and they'll force them. And other times they just hand it over oh, yeah. to the person receiving. And oh, yeah. Isn't that a sacrilege for them to be holding yeah, the vessel? It is. Basically what this is, is it's a, it's a new right practice. It's the mixing of rites. They're adopting a new right practice into the new old right. Yes. So anyway, to answer your question, yeah, they do it different ways, and but they shouldn't be doing it at all in my book. Okay. Yeah. In the new rite, there are many times when there are more than one priest offering or co-celebrating the mass. Why are they all saying the words of consecration when there's only one priest holding the host? Isn't okay. that an actual abuse when they are all saying the words? <clears throat> St. Thomas actually addresses the particular question. He says, no, actually, they're all acting through the single, they're all acting through the priesthood of Jesus Christ to which they all participate. So historically, so historically, that's how it was always done, even in the old rite. So up until, I think it was like 1124 or something, don't quote that date, it's not accurate, but it's about that time that the French, before then, from the time of Gregory until then, what would happen is, is that during the Mass of Ordination, the priests would actually say the whole canon with the bishop, except for the words of consecration, if I'm not mistaken. In certain Eastern rites, they do the same thing. And the idea being is that only it's only the high priest that's going to complete the sacrifice. But then the French started doing the concelebration thing. And, um, and then now it's actually part of the uh, old rite ordination. So... Uh, and so you actually say the words of consecration with the bishop. That's why that it's at the rite of ordination is the only time when the mass is said out loud, the canon is said out loud. Okay, so historically that's the way it's always been. There's other difficulties with um, with concelebration, which I don't really want to get into because it's it's one of those tinder boxes, right? I mean, there's some serious theological issues, but there's also a series, a series of justice, which I'd be happy to talk with you privately. Um, in fact, we can do it maybe at dinner, but the point being is, is that there were, there were other theological issues that the church is not addressing where the abuses are taking place. And that's the problem that I'm seeing. Yes. Yeah, Right. It's a little traditional mess, and they're not, you know, like they're standing for the 
Oh, I see. Do in that case, should we, should we be kneeling? Or... Um, okay, so historically, and as I mentioned, in the church, the people would make responses. And so there were certain rubrics that governed the people. But then once that all changed, and the, the mass, and then you had this structure where what's taking place up here is not necessarily what's going on, that is, in the sanctuary, is not what's going on in the rest of the church. The church ceased regulating what the lay people did. This is why, you, you know... <laughs> You'll be, you'd be in some church and, you know, some, some Italian church and some woman's over there lighting her votive candles. Someone's doing the Stations of the Cross. You know, other people do all sorts of stuff during Mass, right? Now, that's obviously an abuse, and I get that, that the church doesn't want that happening. But the church didn't regulate that. Now, there were certain customs that arose in lo different locations. So in the United States, there were actually two separate sets of customs. There was those where you knelt for the whole thing, except you stood for the two Gospels. The rest you kneel, knelt. For it, then there was the other custom where you would you would sit for the um, the reading of the the epistle, stand for the gospel. You would sit for the offertory, etc. And those were different customs that were in different locations. And the standing, uh, the standing during the Our Father was actually only supposed to be done during High Mass, not during Low Mass in either set of customs. So we're starting to see things get more fluid again, where you're starting to see people starting stuff, doing stuff. That it was simply never done. We're also starting to see, I'm not going to get into it too deeply, but we're starting to see another particular problem, which is that the lay people are adopting the rubrics and behaviors of the clerics and the priests and the sanctuary and doing those things that are proper to people in choir when they're not supposed to be. So this is another difficulty that we're actually starting to see. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's to be expected it's, I'm not saying that it's good, in fact it's bad, but it's to be expected because what's happening is people who don't have a thorough understanding of the tradition will look at something and say, I wanna do this, this is traditional. Well, uh, it has nothing to do with the tradition, right? And so you're seeing that, and especially with some of the younger clergy coming up, you're starting to see that same kind of a phenomenon where that precision in the rubrics and making sure the liturgy is done precisely and extraordinarily rare, some do, some don't. It's becoming, it's becoming sloppy. This is actually one of my biggest concerns if we come out the other end of the chastisement. I'm not convinced that liturgically things are going to be hunky-dory. I think that the new old mass will resurrect and it'll be by and large good, but you're going to see a lot of abuse, a lot of weird stuff because people's principles in the new rite, when they go through the chastisement, the chastisement is not going to strip you of all your bad mental habits. It's just going to enlighten your conscience, right, if it does anything. And so when people are going to come out the other end, and so you're going to just see a lot of aberrations. The, the church is going to have to really clamp down liturgically if they want any sanity in the liturgy. <laughs> Lee. Oh, um, uh, recently I encountered a sloppy altar server, and the patent was over here, and he and, oh, yeah, yeah. and, our, and our deacon gave me communion. Um, is there anything as as the lay person, do, you know, <laughs> you know, any kind of sign? What would, what would do you? I mean, I don't know. No, I don't know if there's that much that you, you can actually do about it. It's really up to the priest to kind of watch that. Usually, what I'll do is if I start seeing the server do that, as I'm going down, I'll just quietly say to him, you know, patting under the chin. So. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was It depends if it's a if it's a legitimate custom of the place. You should follow that custom of the place because the custom has force of law, um, according, both according to natural law and according to ecclesiastical law. So if they have like if the entire congregation stands for the Our Father in the old right, you should stand because that's the custom of the place. But you're not, but you're not sure. But if you, some do and some don't, then you should just follow the customs that was always in place. Well, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedicta Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Super Vos et Maniat Semper. Amen.